Welcome everyone and welcome to today's webinar titled Walla Women. We're excited that you're joining us tonight to celebrate and empower Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women this NAIDOC week. Just to let you all know, the webinar will be recorded and made available with closed captions on council websites following our last webinar. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we respectively meet this evening. For those within the city of Whittlesey, we acknowledge the Wurundjeri people and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which I am this evening, the Tungnarong <laughs> people. I have been practicing that and I did get it wrong, sorry. And I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I would like to take the opportunity to acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders attending tonight and pay my respects to your elders past, present and emerging. We pay our respects and continue our commitment to the amplification of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voices and acknowledge that it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. If you would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which you're on, please feel free to make an acknowledgement of country in the chat box. My name is Megan Harper and my pronouns are she, her. I am the Inclusion and Participation Officer within the Sport and Rec team at the City of Whittlesey. I'm equally excited as I am nervous to be facilitating my first webinar as part of the This Girl Can Local Women's Wellbeing webinar tonight. So I'm keeping in mind the philosophy behind the This Girl Can campaign, which is that you don't have to be perfect, it's just about getting out there and having a go. So a big thank you to Vic Health for bringing us the This Girl Can campaign to Victorian women and for the opportunity to collaborate with four other councils to create a three week webinar series that aims to empower women to embrace physical activity in a way that suits them. We'll start with some quick housekeeping. As a member of the audience tonight, you're set up on mute with your video off. So kick back, relax and enjoy the session. We encourage you to use the chat function for any comments or observations you might have through the presentation. But if there's any questions for the presenters, please pop them in the Q&A. These questions will be answered at the end of the session. And if you have any tech issues, please reach out to Joe on the Moreland Community Connection line. You should see access to the chat and the QA at the bottom of your screen. If you can't, just look for the three little dots and click on them to access the menu. Now, that is more than enough from me. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker tonight, Lena Charles from Spark Health. Spark Health is an Aboriginal owned and led social enterprise specialising in, health, specializing in health promotion and meaningful Aboriginal community engagement. The team are experts in designing, developing and delivering health promotion programs, services and resources. The team at Spark are passionate about preventing the onset of burden with chronic disease in the Aboriginal and Australian population. They're in the business of adding years to people's lives and are excited about health. Lena has joined us this evening to talk about her Wella Women project at Spark Health. Wella Women is an Aboriginal women's health and happiness project that has been delivered to Aboriginal women in Melbourne and online. Wella Women creates opportunities for Aboriginal women to get healthier and happier. To share with us how Wella Women does just that, please welcome Lena Charles. Thank you, Megan, for your um, awesome introduction and thanks everyone for having me. Um, and also, happy NAIDOC week. Um, this is one of my favourite weeks, um, usually during the year, usually in July when it's my birthday as well. But I love NAIDOC week more than Christmas and I'm really happy that I can still celebrate it in some respects and be a part of your NAIDOC week as well. Um, so I've got a bit of a presentation. So what I'm going to do is if you just hold still for a second, I'm going to share my screen um, just because I'm a really visual person and I feel like that's going to be the best way for me to share my journey of Wella Women with all of you. So if you could just give me a thumbs up, Megan, if you can see my screen. Awesome. All right. Cool. So um, Megan's given a really beautiful um, introduction to what Wella Women is, and we're just going to unpack that a little bit. And I want to share just some of the beautiful stories that have come out about um, some of the women and just how they've used Wella Women as a space and a platform to feel comfortable with moving their bodies. So 
Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional lands in which I'm tuning in from this evening. So I'm currently in Burke, outback New South Wales, and the traditional country up here is the Nemba people. So I'd like to acknowledge the traditional country and also acknowledge that um, sovereignty was never ceded and that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. So um, Megan's also given an awesome uh, introduction to a bit about Spark Health and who we are and what we do and what our purpose is. Um, we're also known as Clothing the Gap as well, so that might be a little confusing, but yeah, you might also know us as Clothing the Gap. Same faces, two different names, same people though. Um, so this is the fam. Um, so we're actually really small. I think sometimes people think we're this massive, massive um, business or organisation, but we've got four full-time workers. So we've got Sarah Sheridan, who's the Director of Operations, and we've got myself, who's Head of Impact. So I do the delivery of um, programs such as Wella Women. And then we've got Laura Thompson, who's a Gunditjmara woman. She's the founder of Spark Health. And then we've got Sienna Cotullo, who's a Narunga woman from South Australia, and she's in charge of brand and marketing. So, and we're just taken on a trainee as well. And we've got a few other casuals that help us um, along the way as well. So we're slowly growing, which is um, really exciting. We actually just outgrew our um, space. We're based in Preston, or where we were till about two weeks ago. And we've now moved to Brunswick um, along Sydney Road. So we have a bigger space to, um, you know, stock our products and deliver programs out of. So it's, you know, it's been a really exciting time for us. Um, well, I haven't, been, I haven't been there for a couple of weeks, but it's been a really exciting time back home for the team. So that's a bit about the fam. Um, I thought I'd share a bit more about myself because my journey is kind of crucial in understanding why I deliver the programs I do and why I'm passionate about the work I do and just, um, you know, my purpose of being super relatable to Aboriginal women. Um, so I've gone on my own bit of a health journey and... Um, you know, had to navigate the difficulties of shame barriers and getting moving and all that stuff. So in this picture here, um, they're both me, they're both the same person, but at the same time, they're not. So I've gone on a tremendous um, health journey in a year. So in the picture of 2017, I just ran my first ever um, 4K event. So the Victorian Aboriginal Health Service had put on an um, event um, for the Mother's Day Classic and we got these beautiful um, tops. The top didn't fit me that day. I had to squeeze my knees into them to make it fit. And um, I ran four Ks for the first time. I'd never ran more than a K in my life. And I don't know, something, I had a pep in my step that day and I ran four Ks and I was really, really proud of myself. And so from there, I was like, what, what can I, um, what, else, what else is out there for me and what can my body do and what can I achieve? So I've gone on a tremendous journey um, and I think, you know, I just want to be super relatable to women knowing that you've got to start somewhere and I couldn't run 4Ks um, for a very long time. So um, my journey actually kind of starts here though. Um, so this is a picture of my best friend and I. Um, we're hanging out in Peru, um, hiking Machu Picchu. I don't know if anyone's gone to Peru and hiked Machu Picchu, but it's, um, it's a four day hike and it's really, really tricky. Um, and it's really high altitude. So uh, me and my friend Bon, we had done no um, training in the lead up. I think we just thought we could kind of wing it. Um, and this is us on day two, hanging out at the top of Dead Women's Pass, um, probably almost looking like dead women ourselves because we were absolutely buggered because um, it, was, it was really hard. We spent a lot of time, um, we left before the, um, the rest of the group. So we were so slow that um, we would have to leave about two, two and a half hours earlier in the morning. So about four or five in the morning to go ahead of our group. And then we'd still be the last ones into camp of an evening. Um, and because the altitude's so hectic, you could literally only take 10 steps without like, and then having to stop. So we spent a lot of time hunched over our hiking sticks, um, not only just trying to catch our breath, but also holding back a lot of tears because it was a real big struggle. So um, I had a pretty big wake up call on that trip and I thought if I had moved my body a little bit more, um, I might have enjoyed the sights a little bit. I look back at pictures now and I don't realise how beautiful it was. Um, I'm literally hanging out up in the clouds, but I spent so much time looking down at my feet and my hiking boots, um, just dragging my feet for four days. So I'd gone to Peru, um, decided when I get back from this big trip, I want to make some small changes to my life. And that's when I did the 4K run. So I was 
starting my journey out, but it kind of really started with this day here. Um, so I got home and, you know, thought, what are those small little changes that I could make? And, you know, they're pretty simple things. I got my body moving more. I tried home cooking. I tried new ways to spend time with friends. So previously I'd been partying a lot and all that stuff. And then I traded that in to go on the park run every Saturday morning. Um, still working on this one, trying to drink more water and then going to bed earlier. I totally nailed that one though. Go to bed super early. I'm a bit like a grandma these days. So they were the simple things that I switched up and it made a real impact on my life. And just, um, and then I got into health promotion and just really passionate about that ever since. Um, and so, you know, I talk about that um, I ran 4Ks for the first time in 2017 and wanted to know what was next for me. So I was very passionate about um, trying to run a marathon um, and I was very lucky after applying for three years to finally get accepted into the Indigenous Marathon Project. So a project founded by Rob DeCostella 10 years ago where he took um, four young Aboriginal boys to run in the New York Marathon. And ever since he's taken a squad of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, people to run in the New York Marathon each year. So it, they select people that have minimal to no running experience and teach you to run um, a marathon in six months, which is incredible because it just teaches you the resilience of what you really do have inside you. You've just got to unleash it and a marathon will do that. Um, so unfortunately, I didn't get to go to um, New York, but I got to run my marathon about a week and a half ago. Now I had to go to Darwin and do quarantine and then head into um, the NT, um, into Alice. And I ran a marathon with my squad. I finally met my squad. Um, the whole program had been virtual this year. Um, usually you'd have about four or five camps before you'd head off to New York together, but this was the first time we had met. So it was really special. And then we ran a, we ran a ma marathon at 10 o'clock at night, which was, um, you know, I spoke about how I like to go to bed super early. Well, that was also my marathon, knowing that I had to, um, you know, run at 10 o'clock at night. And so I finished at like 3.30 in the morning, but just an unbelievable experience. And, you know, um, thinking back on who I was at the top of Machu Picchu and who I am at the end of a marathon. I'm a completely different person and anyone has the potential to really unleash that within themselves. And it's just making those small little changes and knowing, you know, the importance of moving your body and why we do that. So that's just a little bit about me and give some context. And I share that story with the Wella women um, just to be super relatable and, you know, um, to inspire as well, because I think, you know, we've got to be able to share stories and, people are going to be able to take on those things as well. So I'll finally introduce to you Wella Women. So Megan um, gave an awesome intro on Wella Women. So Wella Women is an eight-week health and happiness um, program. She's also a superhero. So she's a female Aboriginal superhero. We think she looks pretty cool and she has her own program. Um, so yeah, so we've delivered a couple of um, Wella Women programs. We delivered them face to face for a little bit. So we delivered them in the Western suburbs of Melbourne and then we delivered them in the Northern suburbs of Melbourne. But then due to COVID, um, we put it online. So it's been um, two different ways of delivering Wella Women, but we've seen some really beautiful things come out of both those programs that I'm excited to share with you all. So, um, I really like this quote. I just thought um, I'd chuck it in here. So it kind of sets the, sets the precedence for what um, Weller Women's about. Um, so the quote is, no need to empower me, I empower. And I think, you know, it speaks a lot to, um, you know, Weller Women's not an empowerment program because Aboriginal women are already so empowered. It's just we provide the space for them to utilise that power and realise their true potential. So we're not an empowerment program because we're, as women, we're already powerful enough. So we always share that quote with the women so we know that, um, you know, we're not an empowerment program. The other thing that we always share with the women too is I am more than a number. So we have never, ever um, said that we are aware. It's all about, you know, creating those healthy lifestyle swaps and changes and being the best version of yourself. And we don't care about what sits on the scale at all. So making that super clear to the women as well has been crucial in our program. Um, so I'll talk a bit first about the face-to-face -face sessions and what they look like um, when we were back pre-COVID days, what that would look like when we deliver the Well of Women program. So the women would come together for eight weeks, one, um, once a week for eight weeks for an hour. And we would have a workout together for about 
30 minutes to 40 minutes, we do a group workout um, facilitated by Sarah, who's got her um, qualification in group fitness. And then we would um, have a light dinner together and then we'd have a special guest speaker that would come and unpack a different health and wellbeing topic, whether it's about finding your 30 minutes of movement, about nutrition, about gratitude. Um, we've covered a lot of different topics and a lot of Aboriginal women have come in to share their stories and then um, you know, we've unpacked that and as a group taken away something from that each week. So it's been really beautiful to invite different Aboriginal women into the space to share their journey. Um, I think a really crucial part of our face-to-face um, -face program has been that it's kid-friendly. Um, you know, a big barrier to women, you know, hanging out in programs is that they can't, um, they have to, like, find somewhere to take their kids, and that's often a huge barrier. So we really encourage women to be able to bring their kids, and we provide a space for that. And then it also allows, um, you know, kids get to see their mums and aunties, their cousins, and all that in a really positive environment. So it's also got an impact on the kids as well. So um, kids are actually an um, important and crucial part of the face-to-face -face program as well. Um, so we, we love giving out prizes and stuff. And so we encourage the women to come to as many sessions as they can. But if they come to six out of eight, they get um, one of our Weller Women Active Wear singlets. And then it's, it's just really special. So by the time week eight comes around, we have a really um, beautiful celebration um, and we present the women with their singlets. And it's, yeah, the, they just get so excited. It's definitely one of my favorite weeks um, when we get to deliver that face-to-face um, -face program. Um, and during the face-to-face -face program, um, we have a private Facebook group so that the women can interact during the week and cheer each other on and share stories or share um, photos or um, just anything really. And I think the beauty of the Facebook group is um, the women use it well and truly after the program's already finished, which is really nice. And, you know, they stay connected that way. And we're so happy that we can provide that space for the women to do that. And then, um, so we also, we, we're quite competitive too um, at work. So we provide the women with um, challenges, weekly challenges. Um, it's got a different topic each week. So usually week one will be a sisterhood kind of one to get the women forming together, but we'll do different ones like finding in, um, 30 minutes, having a healthy breakfast. And then we encourage the women to share whatever their challenge is for the week, share their progress in the Facebook group, and then we'll pick a winner. And the challenges, the women just, they love it. They really take it on. And um, and then it's just so nice to see that some of the stuff that the women get up to. And it's nice to see what happens outside the program during the week as well with the women. It makes you feel really connected to them. We love Park Run. Um, so Park Run is something that we've always promoted in our programs, but also, also in Well Women. Um, so depending on where the program's delivered, so for example, for this program, um, the most recent face-to-face -face one, we did it in the northern suburbs. So we let the Well Women know um, where the closest Park Runs were to that area. And then we also, um, you know, hung out at a couple of Park Runs, like, so a lot of us um, at Spark Health have a running background. So we are at Park Run anyway, and we provide a space for the women to come and hang out. And I think it was really nice with the last um, Well Women we did because we had a huge bunch of women start hanging out at the Darabin Park Run. And Darabin Park Run's great. It ha um, you know, they display the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flags and they do a acknowledgement of country and it's a really culturally safe space. And so what happened was we did one Park Run um, during the program, we advertised it once and said, all right, um, Spark Health's going to be there. And we had loads of women come. And then um, even after the program finished, those women were still going to Park Run um, and using that as their time to catch up outside of Weller Women after the program had already finished and um, keeping connected that way. And, you know, these women, like the beauty of Park Run is you don't even have to be a runner. Um, so... You know, some of the women were literally just coming to go for a walk, a 5k walk, and then have a coffee together. So, you know, I think there's just, um, we just really love Park Run and the space that that can provide for women to stay connected as well. Um, this is just, we also provide the women with um, like a timetable um, just to motivate them of ways to get moving and active during the week. And then we also provide them with resources available in the area. So for example, for the last one, um, 
the Get Active Darabin was quite popular at the time. So just making sure that the women had access to that and um, the resources around that was really crucial. Considering, you know, this is about, um, you know, this girl can and the importance of um, breaking down barriers for women to get moving, I really wanted to shed some highlights on um, some of the highlights that I saw with the women getting moving in the last face-to-face -face program. So we usually would do a workout together, but this one particular week we decided to um, get someone in from Ultimate Frisbee. I don't know if anyone's um, played Ultimate Frisbee before, but it's actually really, really, really fun. And the women just, they loved it. Um, I was so surprised how much they loved it. They actually, they wanted to do it every single week. And I was like, I'm sorry, we can't do that every week. But um, just seeing them all get out there and have a go, um, and something that they probably never normally would have tried any other time and just being able to provide that opportunity was really nice and something that I definitely um, in future programs want to um, utilise is um, opportunities like Ultimate Frisbee and stuff as well. And I don't know if anyone's played Ultimate Frisbee, but it gets played in the Olympics and you do, <laughs> there is no ref or umpire during the game. So, like, it's obviously played in the spirit of the game, which I thought was a really fun fact, and I'll remember that one forever. <laughs> um, so, we also try and apply, like, a cultural lens to all the programs that we run. And um, one way that we do that is we play traditional Aboriginal games. So, one particular week, um, it was raining, so we couldn't hang out on the oval. So, we thought we'd just play traditional Aboriginal games the whole time under the foyer of um, the venue. And the women had so much fun. Um, so traditional Aboriginal games allows for us to, you know, um, really share that cultural knowledge on um, games because they're games that are similar to what's played today, but it's, you know, um, talk about it in traditional times and the purpose behind the game and the cultural relevance and stuff. And the women just really loved it. Um, we played for like 40 minutes and they didn't even want to go inside and do the, um, the health and wellbeing topic. And I think, you know, traditional games, um, you know, it suits all kinds of fitness levels and act, like active levels and all that and everyone can get involved and I think it's just a beautiful way to bring people together and I think it's something that we'll continue to do. Usually we just do it as a warm-up game but having it like a traditional Aboriginal Games tournament and stuff is something that we'll definitely explore in future programs. Um, so for our last program we did a celebration um, and I believe um, this is at Eagle Point Lookout, which I think is in the city of Whittlesea. Um, so we did a party on the hill. So the women came to get their shirts. Um, and so it was at Eagle Point Lookout. And so it's a giant hill. And so we had different stations set up along the hill um, with, you know, like music, fruit and water and different activities. So like we got the women to like write letters to their future selves that we posted out later and all that. And, um, you know, these women just really took on the challenge of walking up this giant hill. They brought their families. Um, you know, a lot of women said that eight weeks prior when the program first started, there's no way they would have ever thought about tackling a giant hill like that. So just seeing um, the growth within these women over the eight weeks and then taking on that challenge is something really, really special. And um, yeah, it's just, you know, week eight's always hard because you know it's the last week, but then it's also really, really special as well. Um, so I just quickly touch on just some of the feedback um, that we've had from the women. Like I really want to touch on Jo. Um, so this was Jo's first time doing a Wella Women program and she um, would still be going to Park Run, I'm sure, if COVID wasn't a thing, but she's made Park Run her thing since Wella Women. Um, you know, prior to that, she said that she'd always just sleep in and um, she would never have thought of going out for a run at eight o'clock um, in the morning. And now that's her me time. And she goes and hangs out with other Wella women. And, you know, that's something special that we've been able to see that's come out of the Wella women program. Um, Addie's exactly the same. So now she's really good friends with Jo and she hangs out at um, Park Run every Saturday. Um, and I do believe now that, you know, restrictions aren't as hectic that they're meeting up for runs again. And this is just something that's come out of Wella Women, which has um, you know, been really beautiful to see. Uh, Kathy is another one as well, and she's just been um, able to enjoy, you know, engaging with unique Aboriginal women and then um, getting to know other women in the program has been really um, crucial to her as well. 
So that's a bit about the face-to-face -face one. I'll quickly um, go over the virtual one because this has been really interesting. Um, so COVID obviously hit and we wanted to still be able to deliver the program to women, but we're like, how do we do that um, online? And how do we make it exciting? And how do we make it engaging? So we did our first one in April and we're currently at week seven of our second one. We had 200 Aboriginal women sign up for it. And I guess the beauty in being online is that we've been able to have women from other states tune in. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of women that probably have wanted to come to our programs but can't based on location. Um, so it's been really nice to be able to um, have these other women participate and connect with one another. So that's been, you know, even though COVID's been terrible, um, this has definitely been a highlight that's come out of it. So this just kind of gives you a little look of what um, Wella women kind of looked like. So we'd all hang out on Zoom and then um, I would host the session and I'd have a co-host, which would usually be um, Laura or Sienna, and we'd call this Wella Studios. Um, and yeah, it was definitely a huge learning curve being all tech savvy and stuff. And I guess our biggest challenge was how do we still provide that really safe space for Aboriginal women knowing that they're tuning in from their home and we don't know what their home life is like or anything like that. So it was really important that we still were able to create a safe space and the way that we um, went around it was, you know, we just asked women that when they tuned in, that they tuned in privately because um, it's a women's program. Um, and if they did have a lot going on in the background that they would just flick their video off and we haven't had any issues with that. So that's been really good. Um, so over the eight weeks, um, the women came together for eight Zoom sessions. And then during that Zoom, we would play Kahoot. I don't know if anyone's played Kahoot, but it is so fun. I'm addicted to it. I make the Kahoot quizzes. I just have so much fun. It's like my highlight of the week, getting to pick the questions and stuff. Um, the women get super competitive because there's prizes. So we'll get together for a Kahoot. Um, they will always include um, questions around Aboriginal culture and history as well which the women love and then we get together for about we do two breakout rooms per session and we unpack different health and well-being topics around gratitude and stuff like that and the women I think that's what they love most about the session is getting to meet each other in the breakout rooms of five or six people then um, we release well women episodes um, so that's where all the health and well-being topics so we had to become like um, almost like movie star experts and video makers um, to come up with all these different content. Um, so we, in our episodes, we'd have a segment on getting moving, we'd have a segment on um, nutrition, gratitude, and how to be a change maker. So it was a lot, it was a lot of work. Um, going online, you'd think it would be easier than the face-to-face -face program, but it takes a lot of work to put those videos together. Um, so that's a bit of what you know, what the program looked like. And so the women, these are the things that the women got to explore. So connecting with other Aboriginal women, how to handle self-isolation, keeping active during COVID-19, um, healthy eating advice, and then um, how to become change makers. Um, so we spoke about the free the flag issue, and then we gave the opportunity for the women to speak about issues that they're passionate about and what they want to use their voice for, which was a really powerful session as well. Um, and so I guess, you know, we're talking about how, how do we keep women moving virtually? Um, so we had Sarah, um, our movement motivator, and Sarah is literally a movement motivator. She's motivated me to keep moving on so many occasions. Um, this is Sarah actually hanging out on the Kokoda track from one of our programs in which she motivated me along the track for 10 days. So um, Sarah featured in our episodes um, once a week. And she had she covered a range of topics between um, things like why we get moving, how to get moving, getting moving for everyone, the importance of rest, the importance of stretching, and just other resources. So I don't know how good my internet is going, but I'd like to kind of share just kind of like what one little bit of the move it motivated move it motivator section looks like, just because I think it's really interesting um, to be able to look at what some of the women got to see. So. I know this is connected to my internet. I hope it works. So this is what the intro looked like. All my women all around the world, we come together. La, 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 la. Ooh, sorry.
the intro and then I'll just fast forward to the Movement Motivator segment, which I believe is just about here. Oh, there's Sarah looking very, um, very excited. Hopefully it works. Oh, I've gone a bit too far. Hang on, there we go. Hopefully it works. Oh, there we go. Welcome to closingthegap.com.au. We have a range of information and ways that you ladies can get involved on the campaign. It is now time for our Move It Motivator segment where I'll get Sarah to have a quick talk to you ladies about our Wella workouts. Whee! <laughs> Thanks, hostess with the process. Sarah here, your Move It Motivator. Today, we're going to be talking about how you can use our Wella workouts, which is a work work, to find your 30. So when we're thinking about getting moving, some tips that can be super helpful are these four things. Number one, set a goal. When we know what we're working towards, we know what we're doing. Um, making sure that we tell other people what goal we've set makes it real because then we've got people to keep us accountable. Number two, make a plan. How are you going to get there? What are you going to do to get from where you are now to where your goal is? What are the steps that you need to take to make this happen? Number three, oh, three. <laughs> Number three is enlist others. So drag everybody along with you. Get your family, get your friends involved, make it a social way to catch up. When you've got other people cheering you on and keeping you accountable and a training buddy, it makes it way more enjoyable and you're more likely to make it happen. Number four is make it fun. So one of my favorite things to do a night before I have a, a long run or a workout is to pick a really great Spotify playlist. Think about what I'm gonna wear, where am I gonna go, am I gonna try a new training track? So many things are some things that can make it super fun, feel a bit less like a chore, and we're more likely to make it happen. So there's my four top tips for staying training. If you're looking for some ways to find your 30 in your day to get a little bit more active, I really want you to check out our Weller Workouts. It's a work, work for a Weller Workout. You, what you're looking for is Lena saying, hey, you mob, Lena here. That's what you're on the hunt for. You can find all of these on our YouTube channel, which I'm sure is about to pop up. Let's go this side. Right there. Um, on our Well Aware YouTube channel, you'll find up to 30 at home or in the park equipment free workouts. We've got something for absolutely everybody. If you check out the video descriptors, you'll see that we've got lots of different variations. So whether you're just starting out or running marathons, we've got you covered. Well workouts are a really great way to help you find your 30. They range from 10 minutes to 30 minutes, depending on how many times you repeat them, whether or not you want to add in a walk before or afterwards or a run. However you want to make it happen, totally up to you. Most important thing is that you're giving it a go. So tell us. Show us in the um, Facebook group this week about how you're getting active. Let us know if you give a well workout a go. Bye. Yeah, so that, how motivating is Sarah, right? <laughs> now I'm sure you all probably want to try a Weller workout, which is actually on our YouTube channel, by the way, so you can if you do want to. Um, so oh, I've lost my train of thought for a second because I've been all motivated by Sarah. Um, so also part of our um, Weller Women program for the virtual online one was that during um, COVID, we actually were doing virtual runs um, and we gave the women um, free registration into um, two of our runs during that time. So it was Run Rona and the NADOC run. Um, so the women got to sign up for free and just seeing them really take on this challenge and um, you know cheering each other on in the process was really, really um, amazing. So we got together after we did Run Rona and all the women shared like their triumphs and their challenges during um, their Run Rona. And it was just really nice um, to really unpack that experience for the women and then they went on and took on the NADOC challenge as well. So that was really, really um, special. Um, this is just a quote from one of the women that did the virtual um, program. So she had said, well, women got me out of the house for exercise and a night a week that would otherwise have been spent relatively disconnected from life. So um, I just also really want to um, highlight, so this is Christy. Um, Christy was tuning into Weller Women from Tasmania um, and she took on Run Rona and then she took on the NAIDOC March and she ran a half marathon for the first time. So yeah, it was just, um, you know, really beautiful to see that 
you know, Christy had took this challenge on and, you know, that came from us providing that opportunity for her to register for free um, through Weller Women. And, you know, I'm pretty sure she's signed up for the half again for our next virtual run. So, um, you know, just seeing the growth within Christy just through the virtual program has been really special. Um, so I'm pretty much nearly finished now, but, you know, um, you know, doing this presentation has really given me time to reflect on what is it about Weller Women that, um, you know, we've been able to see women um, break down those barriers around getting moving and why, why that exists when, within our programs. And I guess, you know, I, I believe the keys are um, we're creating safe spaces for these women to feel comfortable to get moving um, in and like wanting to participate as a group. Um, and then providing community support platforms um, has been really crucial as well. And, you know, we've seen these community support programs last beyond the program. So, you know, those women that I was talking about earlier that hang out at Parkrun still and just having those support platforms have been really crucial for these women to keep active and moving. And then obviously um, applying a cultural lens to all these programs that we do and, you know, being delivered for Aboriginal women by Aboriginal women has been really crucial in that as well. And being able to elevate Aboriginal women um, during that process. So, you know, making sure that we provide the women um, with other Aboriginal women that are super relatable has been um, really crucial for the program as well. So, you know, we're up to week seven, you know, week seven of the Well Women program. Um, and we're hoping to be able to deliver more programs as well after this as well because we've just seen um, tremendous growth in the women um, throughout the program. So that's um, enough from me and I'll hand it over for question and answer but you know feel free to you know check out Spark Health or Closing the Gap um, on social media so you can keep up to date for any programs that we do have coming up or opportunities or virtual runs that you want to participate in but I'm also yeah open to any questions you might have, even if you have a question that happens um, that you think of after this webinar, you know, wait a minute, I would actually really like to know that. Feel free to um, send me an email as well and I'll get back to you. So thank you. Great, thank you, Lima. That was really amazing. And I think it was just so wonderful to see all those women connecting um, and making friendships outside of the program and continuing to get active together and so that um, it's not just the eight weeks, it does extend on from that. And there's some really great sustainable outcomes for people. And I think that's an amazing program if you can manage to do that. So thank you. And um, we're fortunate now to have Lena for available for some questions. So if you have any questions, please pop them in the Q&A chat and we'll try and cover up on them all. I just wanted to ask you, Lena, myself, Vic Health has told us that two in five women feel embarrassed exercising in public. And I'm sure there'll be some women attending tonight who can relate to that. So what advice can you offer them to overcoming that fear of judgment um, so that they too can become well women? Yeah, I think I kind of touched on it a little bit in my presentation, but just um, thinking about what are those support systems around you that you feel comfortable in all those spaces that um, you do feel comfortable in and knowing that you can get moving in those spaces. And sometimes I guess those spaces aren't necessarily um, available to you right away or you don't know any, but there are spaces out there that do exist. You've just kind of, um, you know, got to break down that fear barrier and go find them. And I think, you know, as women, we are really supportive um, as a community and just making sure that you do know that there are women out there that feel the same as you. Um, and then taking on that challenge together can be something quite special and powerful. Yep, totally. And I think we saw that by two of your participants with Joe and Addie, yeah. Addie um, how that they've joined forces together and they've got a really great partnership going there. So, um, and I suppose this, is, this relates to, to that in a way. There's a really common focus these days on well-known celebrities and athletes acting as role models. So what are your thoughts around the positive impact that well women can have on closer connections within family and community as role models? Yeah, I think like whilst it's great to highlight, um, you know, the successes of um, well-known role models, um, especially in the Aboriginal community that have fought so hard to get um, that kind of exposure. It's also really important to have like what we call community champions because they're so much more relatable 
you know, um, you know, I think when we have really high profile people, we kind of see them as um, superheroes in the fact that they've got external powers that we don't necessarily um, possess ourselves, even though that's not true. I think that's a perception that we have um, when people come in um, to those spaces. So providing um, people with super relatable, um, inspirational people can be really crucial in that um, respect and because then you can see something in yourself and that person and want to take on something. So we do that in our programs all the time. So um, we'll have a range of guest speakers, but a lot of them are community champions that, you know, live their day to day life like everyone else, but have done some really incredible things that just haven't been showcased the, because they're not high profiled. And I think that makes it super relatable to other women um, to say, I, I can be that person and I can do that too. And they really take something from that. Yeah, and I think that you could see that through the program that the women really encouraged each other and inspired each other to achieve things that they probably thought they couldn't do um, at the start of the program. Um, and yourself in your own journey, um, managing to achieve a marathon, which is an amazing effort. So congratulations. Um, women experience many barriers to participating in physical activity. Um, and you looked at some of the barriers um, through that for well women. And one of the barriers that you did touch on, and I think it was, it's important to um, have a conversation around, was talking about culturally safe spaces. Um, and I thought the Darabin Park Run was a really good example that you used there about exploring a little bit more about how we create culturally safe places for Aboriginal women to participate in physical activity. Do you want to share a little bit more on that? Yeah, I think like you don't realise how um, crucial it is to, it will, speaking from an Aboriginal perspective, how crucial those spaces are until you've been in spaces that aren't culturally safe. So, um, for example, before I was doing Darabin Park Run, I was going to Shepparton Park Run um, and then I rocked up to Darabin Park Run and I saw the flags and I was like, oh my gosh, there's flags here. Like, and I immediately felt really, um, like really proud to see my flag, but then they did an acknowledgement of country and they extended that acknowledgement to any Aboriginal people um, participating in Park Run that day. And it sounds like it's not a lot, but it actually means a lot to Aboriginal people. So. Um, just having that Abri Aboriginal representation in spaces can be really like really important, but then also making sure that it's not done in a really tokenistic kind of way. So you've got to be able to figure out um, the best ways to do that. And, you know, um, doing an acknowledgement of country is so, so important. Um, and doing it more than just reading what's the generic acknowledgement of country, making it really personal, um, it feels really special when you go into those spaces and that happens and having Aboriginal representation when possible is also important. So like um, when I went to a park run in Shepherd and I saw someone with an Aboriginal design shirt and I immediately was drawn to them and felt more comfortable in the space. So just, yeah, representation of culture is probably the number one element to, um, you know, trying to nail that situation, I'd say. Yeah, that's great for us, you know, for, to understand because I suppose even for myself, um, we've got treaty t-shirts in the cupboard and I'm always a little bit nervous about whether or not um, I should or shouldn't be wearing them. So it's really great to get that understanding and perspective from yourself. So thanks for sharing. Yeah, and I think too, as like, you know, that's something that we get asked a lot as well because like, we're also a fashion label. Um, a lot of people like me as a non-Aboriginal person, can I wear that? And I think it's really important, especially with Closing the Gap, um, it's really important that non-Aboriginal people know that they have a role to play in that space. Um, and by you wearing an Aboriginal designed um, piece of clothing, you're potentially opening up to conversation starters in spaces where Aboriginal people aren't present or represented. So, you know, there is power in um, how non-Aboriginal people can um, play a role in that and providing that cultural safety. So definitely, yeah, feel free to wear your treaty t-shirt um, and any other Aboriginal um, owned and designed t-shirt. Absolutely, Will. I've got a, I do have a few. <laughs> um, also, could you expand a little bit on how the difference that running has made in your life and how do you keep yourself motivated to keep getting out there and going for a run? Because motivation can be a tricky 
thing, especially getting started and, and also to keep moving. So share your tips, Lena. Yeah, um, running's absolutely changed my life in a lot of ways than I never thought. Um, it really tests your resilience, um, which I ne I've never considered myself a resilient person until I started running. And, you know, anyone that's tried to run has had those moments where they're like, I want to stop or I should just walk or whatever, like finish your run. Like every time you take that extra step is you challenging that um, voice in your head and it's just building on your resilience. And it's just from going out for a run. It's re really weird that that's the power you can get from it. And, you know, a marathon's not easy, but it, everyone can do it, I think. And, you know, it's, it's more like you run the, for a marathon, for example, you run the first 30 Ks um, with your legs and then everything's your head for the last um, 12 Ks. Um, so every, I think just, yeah, the potential in learning um, about yourself um, on, through running is really cool. And I think I've had moments where I've ran without music and reflected a lot on who I am as a person and my why and my purpose. And, you know, running provides that um, me time. Um, in terms of motivation, I think, you know, Sarah kind of touched on it before, but I always enlist others as my, been my... Um, crucial part or at least telling someone I'm going to do something because me as a person um, I'm one of those people that if I say I'm going to do something I'll do it so if I'm like oh, I'm going to go to the gym at six o'clock like I can't be a liar and I have to do that so <laughs> kind of enlisting other people and then also bringing other people on the journey as well so I was very lucky with my running um, to have a really great bunch of friends and a great support network at work that um, kept me motivated um, and yeah but it, that motivation can come for everything. Like running's not for everyone, but if you've got that, maybe it's swimming, maybe it's riding, maybe it's dancing, maybe it's yoga, you find that thing and like the motivation does come. Yeah, I did make it, that was my lockdown commitment was to, I would really, really like just to run 5Ks. Um, and I haven't got there yet, but I can run for 10 minutes and then run for another 10 minutes and that feels like an achievement for me. That is huge, yeah, absolutely. Like when I did that 4K run, that was my marathon that day. Like I felt like a marathon and I think with running, um, I think the biggest thing that we do is we think we have to go out there and run hard and we don't, um, you know, my, like Rob DiCostello, like who's won Boston Marathon and that always talks about like just take your pace back, like, you know, you can run almost as slow as you would walk. It's still running. Um, and once you train yourself to be able to do that, like you can last a lot longer and it's, yeah. And then everything's just, everything else is just mental. But I used to run, um, I used to run for one song. I used to take music and I would run for one song, walk the next, run for the next one. And then I'd build it up, run for two songs, walk for one. And, you know, just those little mind games that you playing yourself and then you know um, the results do come it's just also patience as well but running for 10 minutes is a long time it is <laughs> it is now because I couldn't run for one minute before and I think one thing that I've learned is to celebrate the successes even if they're if they feel small for me that that's a big deal so um and just to celebrate my celebrate that and rather than say I'm not at 5k it's like well I've run a K and a half and that's much more than I have before. Yeah. So I think being kind to yourself um, is also really, really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. And I would really, we're getting to the end of the session now and I would really like to offer you a heartfelt thank you um, for joining us and so generously sharing your own story um, and the journey of the Well Women program. And I think that we've all really learnt a lot this evening. Um, for those in the audience, um, while we complete the random draw for the winner of the Fitbit, we're going to pop a poll up on your screen. It's a couple of quick questions. If you could just take the opportunity to complete that for us, that would be great. I see that someone's written in the question and answer and says, where is the next face-to-face -face Well Women program likely to take place when face-to-face -face is a thing again? Good question. Um, we don't, we're not entirely sure just yet, but, um, you know, we're um, situated in the northern suburbs. Um, we're situated in Brunswick now, but we have a really good relationship with Darabin um, Council and all the northern suburbs out there. So 
I assume it might be in the northern suburbs, but we might also go regional Victoria as well. So, um, but any women that um, are tuning in and want to know, like, you know, we are up to week seven of the Weller Women Online Retreat, but that doesn't mean that because you've missed the first six, you can't join for the last two. Like, we always encourage women to join the program at any point in time. So if you are interested in hanging out with us virtually, um, you know, feel free to shoot me an email and I can get you all um, sorted to hang out with us on Wednesday night at 5.30 p.m. You know, play, play some Kahoot with me. <laughs> I'm also a big fan of Kahoot, Lena. Uh, Darabin Council is also one of our co-collaborators for this webinar series um, and a neighbouring council to uh, the city of Whittlesea. So, yes, there's, um, they're a good friend of ours out at Darabin. Yeah, we love Darabin. <laughs> we do love Darabin. Um, and I can announce for you that the winner of the Fitbit is Sophia P. So, <laughs> Sophia... Congratulations. I will be in contact with you very shortly um, so that we can organise getting you the Fitbit. Um, so thanks everyone for completing the poll for us. Um, and just finally, because that does conclude the evening for us here tonight. So before we turn the cameras off, I would just like to thank all my co-collaborators collaborators, that's a really big word, um, who've been involved in this web in the webinar series from Moreland, Darabin, Manningham and Yarra Rangers Councils. A big thank you to Joe and Grace for their support behind the scenes tonight and lastly to Vic Health who have supported us to bring this webinar series to you. Thank you for everyone for coming along and if you're keen to attend another webinar series, webinar in our series, check out the event listings on the This Girl Can Vic website. And have a great night off week, everyone.